who is that going to be? Who's going to request Dharma for us? Uh, Just about ready. Okay, good. We're on page 26. So let's go down to the, there we go. Dharma request is starting. Okay. Samasambuddhasa 
Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suche doye olahudi samyao samputoshi. Okay, here we go. Wu Shan Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa. I Chen Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu. Wu Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi. Yan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi. Good. That works. Together, the subtle and profound, supreme and wondrous Dharma rarely is encountered even in a billion eons. But now I see it, hear it, and accept it reverently. I vow to truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Excellent. All right, we did that. Uh, welcome to our Sutra Lecture. It's now Sunday afternoon in Queensland. It's now Saturday evening in Berkeley, California. And we're going to be looking into the Flower Garland Sutra, the Avatamsaka Sutra, as we do um, every night now, uh, every Saturday night in Berkeley for 20-some years. We've been lecturing on Mahayana texts. And uh, so... The one thing that's different about what we're doing um, these days is we're doing one language. And for a long time, our lectures were always bilingual and trilingual because there was always a translation going on up on the balcony here. And uh, recently that's been a Vietnamese translation, but in other times it was Cantonese. And, uh, and we had Mandarin for a while. And, um, but for me, uh, there were years when I was doing my own translation, and I would do uh, 10 minutes of English and then translate for myself 10 minutes in Chinese. And bit by bit, uh, people started to complain because my Chinese translation was shrinking. I was only doing 50, 50 60 percent of my English, especially not the jokes. I wasn't translating the jokes. And, and people said, hey, Pasha, we want to hear the jokes. And, and why are you shorting the Chinese? You should do 150-50. You should do it completely the same. So um, what I realized that the reason why I was skimping on my Chinese translation was because there were not Chinese ears that needed to hear it. It was just kind of a, a, a habit. And because very few of the audience actually needed to or wanted to hear Mandarin translation. So we decided to... Um, I don't to uh, <laughs> here we have Linda here in uh, Gold Coast is wanting to hear Mandarin. Um, so we went to English only with a separate Vietnamese translation, uh, simultaneous, done on the spot by our volunteer translators, which is always welcome. It was uh, Gua Hong for a long time, and then uh, currently it's Mai, Mai Pham has been doing the translation, Liu, uh, Liu Pham did it for a while, and home other people translated so um, we really appreciate that and it also one of the benefits of that is it it uh, trains um, new translators and it improves the, the translation of our improves the skills of our uh, trans or uh, journeyman uh, official translators so you get to hear another language. That was always our kind of our hallmark, our signature. The city of Ten Thousand Buddhas was uh, multilingual sutra lectures. But um, one of the drawbacks is if you if you really if there isn't anybody who needs to hear it, then people who are deeply into the ideas of the sutras have to listen to this and half the time is well, you said you don't understand. And big old Chinese now in that room when you do it, I kind of feel like I understand it. And I kind of get it. It's very funny what people say, you know. So that was that was always uh, let's see here. Would you like to stop sharing your Pardon me. No, I wouldn't. Okay. So uh, 
anyway, we're not going to wait for miracles. So as long as there's no immediate need, we're going to stick with our one language for now. And Linda, your English is fine, so don't give me that. You Besides, you can read the uh, you can read the bilingual printout. Right? Hear the Buddha's voice in two languages. So I'm here in Gold Coast with uh, Sam and with Larney and with Linda. So we have our live lecture going at the same time that we have our our uh, virtual lecture to Berkeley, and we're just about to finish the uh, six ground prose of the Ten Grounds chapter of the Flower Garland Sutra, the Avatamsaka, which I've got a big copy of it here beside me in the monastery. And uh, so we're almost done with the, the prose part. We have some repetitive verses which are going to uh, bring up the principles again. Before we get going, let's invoke the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas by chanting their name. And we'll find it right here. It's right there. Nope, that's not it. Well, let's see here. Yeah, we want this guy right there. Okay. So the um, here's the Chinese, which is what we'll be chanting. And if you don't read the, the characters, you can follow along with the realization below. Here we go. One time in English, together, homage to the Buddha's Flower Garland Sutra of Great Expansive Teachings and the Ocean-Wide Flower Garland Assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Outstanding. Going down to page 24. Pardon me for scrolling. Some people say that makes them nauseous when they try to follow it on the screen. Ah, there we are, right there. Good. Now, um, as people are getting settled in, everybody find page 24 in your text? Um, I wanted to share um, a couple of photos from this week. And um, is, is, anybody, is anybody terribly afraid of snakes? I don't want to shock you. Uh, if, if you are, you want to prepare. But this is a scene from this morning's meditation class. Maybe you want to cover your eyes. Here we go. This is a carpet python, and that's my robe. You're looking at my knee. This is fractal. Fractal is a 17-year-old female carpet 12. python, 12, 12 years old, and uh, she's about six feet long, right? About six feet, mm -hmm. and she came this morning to meditation class, and uh, her her human companion brought her in. We got to uh, encounter the uh, the wonders of a carpet python, and she's very mellow, very sweet, and and uh, you know, uh, easygoing and obviously not afraid of us. And 
it, it, there's an initial oops, you know, and then you go, no, oh, this is a nice snake. Notice no pointed nose. And these things here are what help her uh, smell, uh, along with her tongue, where she can. They say that um, carpet pythons can pick up the scent of a mouse from a quarter of a mile away. That their tongues, mostly, most of their, when they stick out their tongue, they're smelling. And uh, so she really liked my robes, and I don't know. Don't make any Freudian interpretations of that. I don't. I don't think that's appropriate. But she's like under my robe, and I had bare feet because it, you know I took my shoes off to go in, and her tongue hit the sole of my foot. She, <laughs> you know, uh, tickled by a snake's tongue on the sole of your foot. That was a new one for me. So this, so this is fractal. And she's very, very mellow. Um, the other picture I want to share is um, similar in that it's another reptile. It's a couple reptiles. And this uh, happened just outside the meditation hall. And it was a turf war between two male dragons, they're called. They're called Eastern Bearded Dragons. And they're definitely part of uh, ancient Australia. There's definitely a feeling that this particular combat has probably gone on for millions of years. I'll show you what I mean. These are two male dragons. That's the real name. They're really called dragons. Some, th some people call them frilled, frilled lizards, but they're not. They're dragons. And these two guys, they were probably three and a half feet long. And they were very serious about this combat. Um, they circled and circled and circled. And they used their tails as weapons to smack each other. And I also saw them uh, go sideways with these spikes, kind of hoping to, to uh, gouge the other one. And they also bite. But they don't have any teeth per se. They're kind of like... Uh, like try to choke them, each other, but they circled each other, and for an hour, I'm sure, and then they seemed to get tired. They just got fatigued, and one of them walked away, and we figured he lost, <laughs> the one, the one who split. But uh, this, once they establish who's in charge, then uh, that's they're the boss, they're the alpha male of the territory. So what a fascinating place Australia is, and you. You really uh, get to appreciate the, all the different creatures that, that lived here first. The humans are definitely the, the, the last ones in. So. Okay. Anybody scared of snakes? I hope didn't. People don't like spiders, by and large. When I, whenever I post a picture of a spider on a social network site, nobody likes it. There's, there's very few... You know, mostly it's like, ooh, take, please take that down. So we're kind of wired that way, I'm afraid. All right. So here we go. Let's start right here. We're on page 24, and we've got to go to the top line of, um, let's see here. Up. Uh, I got to the wrong one. Sorry, my mistake. This is the Phoenix Yes, we did. We want, that's not the one we want. We want here. We want the bottom, my mistake, bottom of page 26. 26. Arsh review. Yes. Okay. We'll start with Fordzi, Pusa, Jutsu. Okay. Ready? Here we go. Fordzi. Pusa Jutsu Shen Chen Di Jong Pusa Jutsu Shen Chen Di Jong De Boro Bolo Mi Hung Zeng Shang Louder Sam can hear De Di San Ming Li Shun Ren Yi Yu Zhu Fa Ru Shi Xiang Sui Shun Wu Wei Gu Okay. 
we'll assume everybody's reciting there. Okay, now um, I'm going to just go ahead and invite you to join me, and we'll do it in unison. And I'll you'll, you'll finish just a couple seconds after me, but that's fine. Here we go. Disciples of the Buddha, when the Bodhisattva is dwelling on this, the ground of manifestation, he achieves increase of the practices of prajna paramita. Yeah. He obtains the third level of patience, that of clarity and keenness to accord. He accords with the real mark of true thusness of all dharmas and does not oppose it. Hi, hey, Foster. Um, this is Jerry. So when you share the text, can you uh, can you make the text larger so people online can see more clear? You bet. Okay. Now, what I would like to do is translate again. Again. Let's see if we can't free up some memory here. And here we go. All right, we're learning about a bodhisattva and what a bodhisattva does, how they think, how they act, what they do. And we're, I think one way to um, enter the text is to, uh, let's see, provisional translation, is to, to look at it at the level of language. What is being said here? What is it, you know, did the Buddha know what he's talking about? Because I sure don't, you know. That's it. You'd be excused if that was your attitude. Because I think it's hard to understand what this means. If we only look at the text the way it's presented here, it seems like the Buddha doesn't speak the way anyone else speaks. He doesn't speak real English. Well, not the case. The Buddha is fluent, but our translation of it. Um, needs to uh, accord with that understanding. So, what is going on here? Let's take a look. Our Bodhisattva is almost done with the sixth ground. So, disciples of the Buddha, that would be us um, now and them then. When the Bodhisattva is dwelling, you don't dwell on a ground, on this, the ground. When the Bodhisattva stays on the ground of manifestation probably needs because it's a title he achieves increase of the practices to achieve increase doesn't make sense to me what does that mean let's see uh, make that a little bigger there okay Chinese says bodhisattva when he stays there on this ground this stage De boro bolo mi hung sung jang. Okay, to de hung, to get de hung sung shang. There we go, sung shang. Okay. So sung shang means increases. He, his practices, his practice. of prajna paramita, which is a, uh, needs to be explained, increases. Okay, that's English. His practice of prajna paramita increases. Now, so, if that's what it says, take a look. Here's the Chinese for folks who are not familiar here. For the disciples of the Buddha, bodhisattva, pusa, Here's the verb, stays, abides, dwells, lives, rests, this, shen, shen, di, um, manifestation, stage, 
amid. Here's a verb. The Dhamma Master Priests. I think we're losing the um, audio. That we don't have so, Dhamma Master, um, I think we're yeah. losing your audio and the video. Um, your video feed now is uh, frozen. Lose uh, work. Where did it lose the work? Uh, it's still, I think the connection is still uh, not so good. Oh, of course. Uh, let's hear. I'm sure if, it, if it's possible to um, On the work, switch to cable. Okay. Do we have. So we still can uh, hear you. Translation. This really makes sense. Yeah. Beautiful. Good. I need to get my thank you. Yeah, this is what we do. We do a small time. Okay. Share my webcam. Audio. Can you hear me now? Yes, for sure. Yeah, we're back. Very good. good. Nice. I'm glad. Okay, that wasn't so bad. I hope you all crossed your legs and entered Samadhi, right? You did that. Okay. 
Good. Well, we did. We plugged in a cable. We have an adapter, and looks like it's working. So, uh, Yuan Lin, did we solve the problem? Yeah, so far so good. Excellent. Good. I think that's progress. All right. So here we go. Um, <coughs> so uh, okay, our question is, what is the practice of prajnaparamita? Um, this is our. This is one of the uh, main themes of our chapter now. The chapter of uh, the sixth ground of, of the ten grounds chapter on the flower garland sutra, and this is um, it's number six, and this is a very interesting and helpful way to look at this thing called the bodhisattva path, which is um, there are six levels and there are ten levels, and this they correspond to the paramitas, and the paramitas let me go down here. The paramitas are also called perfections, and they're also called six ways across. Six paramitas and ten paramitas. There's two different lists of them. More common is six. And paramita itself translates as perfection and also a way across, crossing over, like a bridge, like uh, a ferry, like a um, ferry boat, like a ford, you know, uh, a, a shallow place where you can cross over. So that's another way, is a way across. Ooh, it's also called Dao Bian. Okay, uh, for that, here we go, that reaches the other shore. Now that's uh, picture language, that's an analogy for saying in our lives, mostly before we think to wake up, we're kind of confused, sometimes clear other times, then we're confused again. And there's very much a sense of time passing. Um, I'm 65 this year, soon to be older than that even. And uh, I know, believe it or not, 65. Whew. You're still, and you're still alive? <laughs> Jeez. You know, they say. If you're old and you don't die, you're considered a thief. So, and that's just, <laughs> what a horrible saying that is. So, so, at age 65, time compresses. Most elders will say that. It, it just, you know, the days zoom by. And remember being a teenager and younger and thinking, you know, it's endless summer. Summer is always summer. And there's plenty of time. And when you get older, you realize, my goodness, it's just the days and the nights zoom by. So, we're on this shore observing how we're racing along towards some sort of an end who knows where it ends well we don't want to think about it we're in denial about that and there's a f stream just zooming by which is the stream of afflictions like a current a river going by a broad river moving fast and affliction just means troubles it's a lot of pain there Sometimes it's good, but it doesn't last, you know. And even if I manage to keep an equilibrium, as soon as you look around you, you see a lot of pain. For example, this morning, I woke up and uh, went out onto the deck, and there was our have a heart rat trap caught a very large rat. And I had set it last night with a date, you know, a sweet date. Uh, Persian date, and put it in there, and went out at 11 o'clock, and the rat hadn't found it, but I went out this morning, sure enough, there was a big rat, and as I went down to investigate, the poor rat was terrified, 
and she, I somehow felt it was a she, made this noise. And the noise was, uh, I can't imitate it, but it, she was, it was a scream. It was a rat scream, you know, thinking, here's this huge thing about to take my life. And I felt so uh, sympathetic for this rat, you know, because it was trapped in a cage. And for all it knew, I mean, it just wanted something sweet to eat, right? And it got, pow, the door came down, and there she was. Luckily, her tail was inside, because we caught one before where the door <laughs> hit the tail. Anyway, I was just this, you know, still kind of groggy uh, from just having uh, come out of sleep, and to be hit with this wave of fear and misery, this poor, furry, big, four-legged critter, you know, just trying to eat, and we caught it. So I texted Sam, big rat. And so Sam put the rat cage in the golf cart and took the rat on a field trip, went on a field trip, how lucky, two kilometers away and set her down, one kilometer away, two kilometers away. And I mentioned this in meditation class and they somebody suggested we put nail polish on her tail and see how long it takes her to come back <laughs> because probably 48 hours I think, she'll be right back. Anyway, so just to being totally in touch with the suffering of living beings, you know, my goodness. And then you think of folks who are um, forced by circumstances off of their home and have to become refugees, oh, that kind of suffering. These are all afflictions, it's flowing along. And then we hear, because we're looking at Buddha's wisdom, we hear that there's another realm. There's a realm where suffering ends, and it's done for good because the roots of that suffering which are confusion about the self and pursuing desire to please that self, confusion about those things, is the source of the suffering. There's a place where that ends, and that place is across the stream of affliction, and they call that nirvana, the other shore. So we're on birth and death, this shore, getting older by the minute, by the breath, there's this flow of afflictions in between, but there's another shore of nirvana. Paramitas are the way across. Okay, that whole long spiel was describing paramita, bolo me. Okay, when we get to six, things change. First one is, say, we typically say giving or generosity, charity sometimes, but mm, yeah, just a generous spirit. Second is morality, ethics, character, precepts. Okay, these two are the foundation. First one says we cross over by sharing by the things that I like, I want to give to others so their happiness grows. Every time we give, we give part of that self away. So the, the self that wants it all for me shrinks. The generous connection with living beings, that happiness that comes from generosity, grows. Two is a way across is you realize there are certain behaviors that reinforce the self and there are certain behaviors that can shrink the self and put us, instead of being basing all of my decisions on strengthening me in the middle, separate from everyone, instead I reinforce the behavior that makes connections with everyone, that makes me feel beyond my boundaries. And the Buddha said, those behaviors to avoid and the ones to increase, killing, avoid that one, bestow life, be, be generous with your support of life giving, use have a heart traps, don't use poison or rat traps that hurt them. Two is behavior around material goods, stuff, don't steal. Instead, Share what you have. 
related to the first first parameter. Three is sexual misconduct, in other words, relationships. So life itself, the things that support life, and then when lives come together. So if you're married, be true to your vows. Don't be, don't cheat. If you're uh, not married, there's a traditional interpretation that says be pure. There's a contemporary interpretation that says be, uh, don't be promiscuous. If you're committed in a relationship, stay committed. Don't hurt people with selfish sexual desire. Either in, in a modern world, if you use the traditional interpretation, abstinence, people don't, they're not willing to hear that. Uh, and it can, can backfire. If um, you teach instead to simply respect yourself and to refuse to harm others, with selfish personal desire. That makes sense. People say, that's right. I understand that. So that's the third one. The fourth behavior that the Buddha said, the fourth place to look, which will put us on the right track, is words I speak, is integrity. So honesty. And be sure that whenever I enter society, on the realm of words and language, when would that be? Making promises, writing contracts, making agreements, giving my word, buying and selling, um, even telling myself what just happened. I can lie to myself if I refuse to see what just happened. And if my vision of the things around me is colored by prejudice and bias, that's a kind of dishonesty. So, integrity, no lying. That's the fourth, the, that's the fourth area where the Buddha said, if we really pay attention, we can cross over. And the last one is intoxicants. The um, larger goal of this project is wisdom. And then compassion, which is the application of that wisdom. And if we intoxicate ourselves, if we are, if our mind is constantly in a state of, of uh, intervention with substances in our bloodstream, it's harder. It's way, way harder to actually report your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind accurately to the mind so that we're totally responsible for our behavior. Um, when I was... Uh, younger. I was I was never into hard alcohol, but I used to enjoy drinking beer with my, my dad, you know, when I was in college and things. And uh, it I was very sensitive to alcohol. And if I drank a single beer, I could still feel it days later. I, I was really aware that that was my uh, bloodstream was was mixed with substances that when it hit my brain, you know, made me dizzy, and that was fun when you're watching football and stuff. But if you're at a certain point, you go, yeah, fun is, that's fun, no doubt about it, but um, I'm doing something else now, which is trying to see through my mind to its bottom, right? So, uh, in that case, intoxicants don't help me. I'm impatient. I grew in, after a while, before I left home, I was, um, any time I used any kind of intoxicating substance, I couldn't wait to get sober. Because it was like, oh man, you know, this is, it's a little tedious. Just, it's not the fun that it used to be. And I know that uh, the flavor of my own mind calm and pure was a special flavor. That was what I was looking for. It wasn't that I was putting down alcohol because it was bad and evil. It was that compared to the flavor of focus and stillness and clarity, uh, seeing deeper in my mind couldn't compare. That was a flavor that um, I earned on my own and wanted to taste all the time. So. I think progress in meditation, progress in cultivation happens that way pretty much every, in every case. Certainly it's true for uh, being a vegetarian, which is what I find um, when I tell people 
Uh, anything about diet that has an edge on it turns them off entirely. The answer is, the response is, get out of my face. Why are you talking about my food? I don't want you in my dinner table. You know, what, what business do you have telling me what I should eat? My mother loves me and she feeds me. The food that she serves me is proof of her love. And you're telling me she's wrong, my mother's wrong. Bye. You know, I don't want to listen to you anymore. So it's total turnoff. So telling people they are bad or wrong because of what they're they're in the habit of eating, doesn't work. Doesn't work. This is not the way to make vegetarians. It doesn't work. Instead, what does work is you invite them to the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery on a Sunday noon and say, "Come join our lunch." You know, and they look at that incredible serving line with vegetarian food that is just it smells good, it looks good, it tastes good and and they you invite them to eat as much as they want and there's something about that food especially when it's cooked with a blessing you know when you know that the people that were preparing that food were reciting mantras and, and praying over the food that has a flavor that no sauce can, can match. And so the best way to make vegetarians is to say, hey, try this. You like that? Yeah. Meanwhile, you know what? Nothing died. Nothing died for that lunch. Mm. You know, and you say, there's no face in that plate looking up at you. <laughs> Nobody's mother is crying because of what you ate for lunch, you cruel, heartless. No, you don't say that. You say, it's good. And you'll feel better too. That's the way to do it. So, uh, same thing with this fifth precept, intoxicants. I mean, the whole world loves intoxicants. Every culture has its, you know, alcohol of some sort. And uh, in Japan, it's osake. My ancestors in, uh, in Ireland, you know, you t <laughs> if you go around preaching that fifth precept, there will be very few Irish Buddhists, guaranteed, because... Life is hard in Ireland, and you, you know, after work, you go uh, have a, two pints at Pat Joe Murphy's, and you get to hear the news and be with your friends, and, you know. So as soon as you start preaching that, mm. however, what you say is come and meditate and look deep the, into your thoughts, and then tell me how you feel. And after you've had a really good meditation, then you go in a bender, and you think, Oh, my head hurts, my stomach hurts, I fought with my friends. I like to go meditate. Mm -hmm. So the proverb is you win more flies with honey than with vinegar, which we're not catching flies, mind you, but right? Yeah. You you catch more kookaburras with veggie ham than you do with let's say, no, that's not gonna work either. How do well, you know <laughs> we need it's positive reinforcement. So those that's the second part of talk is you say, um, I want to cross over the sea of suffering to the other shore of nirvana. And the best way to do it, according to the Buddha, is to cherish life, cherish property, cherish relationships, cherish integrity, and cherish clarity and wisdom. That's the way to do it. When you hear that, you think, that makes sense to me. Much better than no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lies, no intoxication. People don't want to hear that. At least I didn't, as a freedom-loving American. So, freedom-loving Aussie probably don't like to hear that either. So. But if you say it in a, in a way that makes sense. Furthermore, I really believe the precepts were given to meditators practically. They were given, the Buddha said, oh, you like to meditate? Avoid these things and your meditation will go deep. On the other hand, if you kill and try to meditate, it's just all woozy. Steal and you meditate, you can't forget it, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So that's number first one and two. That's the foundation. Three and four are another pair. Three is patience. Four is vigor, strength, virya, patience, paramita, the perfection, perfection of patience. You could run a perfection in front of all of these. Perfection of. You could do this. 
And this is uh, another way across. These, if you see the um, the paramitas as pairs, it works. They work. So the perfection of giving and morality, giving and precepts, are, um, those are the foundation for um, our going across, our crossing over. Patience and vigor are ways to solidify, to strengthen, and to protect our practices. Right? There's a wonderful verse in the Avatamsaka that talks about how the six perfections, the six paramitas, divide into three pairs of two, three, pair, three pairs. And the last two are the, let's see here, perfection of concentration, meditation, samadhi, dhyana. Dhyana, yep, here we go, dhyana, samadhi, and the perfection of prajna, wisdom. There we go. So we have giving, morality, patience, vigor or strength, samadhi, and wisdom. What is this? When, let's get rid of those spaces, we can see them all on one screen. When these are well established, solid, and practices begin to change our lives for the better. We do it regularly with strength. There are two results that take us across from birth and death over the sea of affliction or the stream, the flow of trouble to the place where trouble ends, nirvana. These are the results. Stillness and concentration and then insight that arises from that. All right, so that's my list. You'll notice one, two, three, four, five, and six. When we look at the Bodhisattva path, this pattern comes back over and over and over again. Giving and precepts is stuff we do every day. We're generous and we learn to adopt our behavior towards the Buddha's guidelines. When we start to practice, maybe we're meditating, maybe we're bowing, maybe we're serving, maybe we are reciting mantras, maybe we've mm, decided to, to, to um, make offerings, we're going to be Dharma protectors. We need to make those practices to make it work, to actually change ourselves. We have to do those regularly with strength, patiently. Just say, for example, um, meditation. We, today was our meditation class here at Gold Coast. Um, when we first start, often we start by ourselves and we meditate when we can. You know, um, in between phone calls, in between walking the dog, um, not when we're at work, unless we have a remarkable workplace. We kind of fit it into our lifestyle. And if we're lucky, we have friends. Maybe we join a group. Maybe we have a monastery close by or a meditation center. Maybe we do a 10-day retreat, you know, a Vipassana type retreat. Um, and somehow we get to a place where we start to let other stuff go so we can meditate. You know, we like, mm, you know, I'm... I'm going to get to bed a little earlier tonight because my meditation group is meeting in the morning. That's a change. And that's a real, um, what do you say, a benchmark. That's a landmark. When we start to give up other stuff in order to allow our meditation uh, 
a chance to grow. Kind of like a uh, we plant corn and it breaks ground, you know, or the, the peppers on the vine start to come out, or the tomatoes. And bit by bit, um, the more we do it, um, the more we recognize we're making choices in favor of our practice. That's patience and vigor. Okay? Now, um, I did a, a bowing pilgrimage um, for two and a half years when I was in my early formative, formative years as a monk. And um, the first month of that pilgrimage happened in the streets of Los Angeles. And the uh, we would start at sunrise and finish at sunset. And I realized this was in spring. It was, we began in May, so we were going through the spring. And we went from one Wilshire Boulevard all the way to Santa Monica, entire length of Wilshire Boulevard, which is, you know, we're 30 days. Um, and Wilshire Boulevard took about 20 of those days. So when you're bowing, you know, surrounded by people, and we couldn't bow across streets, so we had to count bows walking across the street, find a corner, and bow there in place. So, you know, on one hand, what we were doing was just weird, just, I mean, bizarre. Who in the world would, like, be an exhibitionist out there on a street corner bowing to the ground? It's like, hey, dude, do that in a closet. You know, go inside. What's, what are you trying to do? You know, we heard that a lot. And why are you kissing the ground? That can't be sanitary. You know? So, yeah, it's weird. That's a weird practice. But we had to go through Los Angeles because we started in South Pasadena. When we got out on the highway, Highway 1, um, going places where there was no other human for days, like through Big Sur, it was different. And the city had the pressure of traffic lights and honking horns and shop owners who were confounded by us in front of their door. Hey, don't do that here, you know. And by passers-by and all kinds. And it's a pressure to keep you focused. When you're out and there's only seagulls in the wind, um, there's another kind of pressure which is you just feel like uh, your body and the wind are one. It's just like whew, blowing through. It's hard to hold on to your boundaries. It's hard to be still there when you're bowing for eight hours, like a slow yoga, you know. And you stand up. And I had uh, Marty Hong Chao, Professor Verhoeven, behind me, watching me. So I couldn't slack off because he would... In he would instantly know. And besides, after a while, we had a, uh, a keen awareness of each other. We would somehow, Master Hua encouraged us to bow in tandem so that we weren't both down at the same time because cars don't see us. They're going to, you know, they can roll right over. So one of them is up and the other is bowing. bowing. So we were kind of in a, in a sink like that. So my point is in this is to say... Um, those things keep you going. They, they took me past a place where if I was in my, my normal mind, I would say, I think, okay, take a break. I think it's time for a nap. You know? Your mind gives you that kind of feedback and couldn't, couldn't. There was no napping, there was no drink, there was no email, it didn't exist. So those circumstances um, allowed me to continue bowing past my comfort zone to a place where I had to measure up to the form. And there's something here about this. What I'm talking about is number four, right? It's called vigor and strength. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from telling yourself to be patient. You're not done yet. Not yet. There's a cookie ahead, but not yet. There will be a reward later. Just don't stop now. Okay? So you tell yourself that, and then you let the, here's the word, you let the fa work on you. 
the I just typed in two Chinese words, fa, man, fa is a third tone, man is second tone. Um, think of this as a, we would, it's literally dharma door, but think of it as a, now I'm going to spell it the Aussie way, mold, like a cookie cutter. Okay, think of it as a mold, a fama. The idea is the Buddha gave us many, 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 many methods of practice. And if you think of them as a cookie cutter, as a mold, a fa, fa as a verb means to model, to imitate, to, to be like it. And over time, I realized that these practices that I was doing bowing for example meditation and you don't have to bow on the highway to get this effect you can learn this if you meditate is that there is a shape um, not only for the body but a shape for the mind of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas awakened beings arhats and sages and saints wise people men and women there is a mold a shape and I take my body mouth and mind spirit and nature and put them into that mold and then let repetition and enough time elapse so that I take on that shape. That's strength. Virya paramita. If you pull it out of the oven before it's done, it's just hot clay. I'm mixing metaphors here. I'm thinking like potting. Right? If you pull the cookie dough out of the oven before they're done, it's just hot dough. Right? It's not a cookie yet. It hasn't been cooked through. So cultivation, these, what was our text? Our text said the practices of paramita. Right? Here it was. Um, he achieves increase of the practices of paramita. Well, that's really clumsy. That's not real English. It's, oh, it was up here. Right. His practice of prajna paramita increases. Or his, we could also say, his prajna paramita practices increase. We could also do it that way. Now, are there prajna paramita practices? Yes. That would be one way to do it. His prajna paramita practices increase, or I think the other way is also good. His practice of Prajnaparamita. Let's see. His. Right. There. Practice of the Prajnaparamita increases. All right. So, what is it? It's this. The Bodhisattva here has done number one, two, three, four, and five. When he does his practice long time his mind gets pure and still okay number five the one we just finished the fifth ground is the last you could say on the ground paramita it's the last one of these perfections that actually is still within our uh, linear reality our dual reality where Right and wrong, true and false, front and back, day and night, male and female, all exist. When you meditate, you're still using your body and mind, and you bring them to a single-pointed concentration. So dhyana, Sanskrit word, means chan, right, or zen, same word. Samadhi, Sanskrit word, means right stillness and right feeling. Zheng, ding, zheng, shou. Okay. During your meditation, things change after a while, and there's a profound difference in your seeing of your body and your mind and the world around you, and that duality goes away. Prajna paramita arises. In Prajna Paramita, you have erased the differences between body and mind. 
you have um, changed the way you actually perceive things and while you're still very, very keen about true and false, right and wrong, principles didn't go anywhere, but you understand a non-dual reality at the same time. To draw a picture, practice perfections one through five, there's an airplane, the I say patients, the clients, no, the passengers, the passengers of the airplane, the victims of the airplane get on board, the passengers of the airplane get on board, the pilot gets on, the engine start up, you're going down the runway and you get to the right speed at number five, number six, the airplane takes off. It's true in every one of these chapters of ten, the ten dwellings, the ten practices, the ten transferences, and now the ten grounds. Those are the chapters in the Avatamsaka. When you get to number six, the plane takes off. Okay? And things are no longer in a straight line. The perfection of wisdom sutra, Prajna Paramita, particularly the Diamond Sutra, says what? It says the Bodhisattva crosses over every single living being. There are no living beings taken across. And you go, wait, run that by me again. That sounds like a contradiction. You're right. Duality has changed now. Okay? There are different levels of truth. So, in the Heart Sutra, what does it say? No eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. No sight, sounds, smells, tastes, sensations of touch or dharmas. Right? Uh, no field of the eyes up to and including no field of mind consciousness. No ignorance, no end of, ending of ignorance. Right? So the bodhisattva wakes up here. When you get to stage number six, everything's different. So we've gotten to the 12 links in our sixth ground. Everything is different. So I just wanted to point that out. That's a long discussion of where we are with the paramitas. His practice of para prajna paramita increases. What does it mean? It means he can be in the world talking to somebody who's got a problem and the bodhisattva understands that the problem is totally bound up in that person's ignorance and confusion and attachment and he can see where that person is clinging and blind to the truth and yet he is totally involved in helping that person solve that problem as if it were his own problem. No different. So his practice of Prajnaparamita, he can uh, be completely involved in people's suffering and yet he himself never loses sight of the uh, empty, signless, markless, wishless nature of those that suffering. It doesn't really exist, it still hurts like man. Right? That's what it means. He's got those two levels. He's got a whole new set of vision that has opened up after meditation on the fifth stage here. This is where the transformation happens when he's meditating, and what is born is wisdom. When that wisdom happens, you see things with two different levels. As a result, you yourself don't get as upset as you used to about stuff that used to press your button all the time. It's like, nah, you know, I don't have to. I, I used to really get upset about that, Mom. <laughs> Mom, you, you can't push my button anymore. I'm going to take my button back, Mom. <laughs> you know, And she's like, Oh, you're different ever since you started to meditate, you know. But I love you still. As long as you're happy, you can go to that place, even though you've turned your back on God. <laughs> you know. Yes, Mom. That's right, you know. Bless your heart. <laughs> Let's meditate, Mom. Well, I don't think so. You know. So, anyway, she can't push your button anymore, and you didn't think of a way to cross her over. Okay, so, so far so good. What do you all think? Stephen, does that make any sense? Any reflections? What, about, about my mom? 
<laughs> you, you, uh, I, I realized when I asked that I didn't mean to put you on the spot. But if you want to, no, I just what do you? Uh, my, my explanation about going through like five levels and then that sixth one opens up and you can see it's like you're in the pool but you're not entirely wet. If that, I don't know, or you're wet but it doesn't bother you. I, I like the plane better, I think. The plane, the plane. <laughs> Mixing metaphors. Now that thing about your mom. Let me see now. Never mind. Yeah, I, we just, you know, we just don't talk about it because okay. she really doesn't want the answer. Um, so she keeps fishing around around the edges. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. She has never asked me straight out. So, um, so we continue to coexist. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Got it. My mom, bless her heart, you know, she uh, wanted to, she, she passed away one year and two months ago. She really wanted to go to heaven and sit at the right hand of God, uh, and I hope she made it. And here's a funny situation, right? I'm... Uh, I'm the senior monk at Berkeley Monastery, and they're younger monks in precept years than I. And I've been a monk as long as I'm in, pretty much, although Tam, Tam there is a little older than I am, not by much, a little older. But there aren't very many people in the room older in years than I am, much less in precept years. And so those people have always known me as the Buddhist monk, right? And so they figure, oh my goodness, his mom must really be a good Buddhist, right? You crossed your mother over, right? I go, no, she's a Christian. <laughs> they go, but Fosher, isn't your mother like, no, nope, she's a Christian. Well, you didn't take her across, quote. No, I didn't. You know, I didn't confuse her to think that because her son believes in Guanyin Bodhisattva, she has to too or I'm not happy. I wouldn't put that pressure on my mother because I know it wasn't in her heart, you know. And... Now, had she, had she blinked, you know, had she shown any, like, uh, leaning towards Guan Yin, um, I would have happily, you know, put some pressure on her, but I didn't. <laughs> so, you know, it's, there it is. So, Stephen, I know exactly what you're saying. It's the fact that her son is a Buddhist doesn't, uh, imply that she should be, because she doesn't know any other Buddhists. She knew Master Hua, and she really thought a lot of Shifu. Um I can prove that. I just want to share something here. Um, we, uh, actually it was Mai, thank you Mai, for forwarding this on to me last week. Let's see, here we go. Um, there is a a video out there. This is kind of fun. Uh, here we go. Uh, let's see. Open. Oh, there we go. There we go. Hold on here. I'll share this with everybody. Just you can't see all of it, but um, you can see the still. This is the grand opening of the City of Ten Thousand Buddhas in 1979. That's me, and I've got a bowing bump on my head, you'll notice, because at that time, uh, Marty and I were still bowing. Oop. There. That's, this is a bowing bump. It's going to take a minute for them to be able to see it. Okay, so this is City of 10,000 Buddha's grand opening. What I wanted to share was this picture here. There's my mom. Oh. She is standing there next to Shurfu, and she's uh, telling him, isn't that nice? She's telling him uh, that uh, she appreciates his wisdom and his kindness in teaching everybody about Buddhism. And I'm like, you know, my goodness, my mom's just uh, learned a lot <laughs> in a short time. So, anyway. Um, that's out there, and you can see, uh, oh, this, by the way, I should share this too with everybody. People here at the city of, uh, at, 
people at Gold Coast Dharma Realm will appreciate um, seeing Dharma Master Hung Chur as a young woman. Oh. <laughs> How about that? This is Bhikshuni Hung Chur. There she is. How about that? We're so young. So young. See? <laughs> See what happens? Oh my God. Fear old age. What a lot of suffering. So, anyway, there we go. Um, so, yeah, just to say, this is um, uh, a progressive reality crossing over. Um, I need to actually finish these lines or else we didn't even do a paragraph here. Um, so let me go forward here. I'll just see here, right here. De di san ming li shun ren yi yu zhu fa ru shi xiang shui shun wu wei gu. We're going to go find that. Oh, that's that's where we are, right there. All right. He obtains the third level. He reaches. You know, attain that patience. Third level of patience, <coughs> that of okay, Ming Li Shun. He he accords with. Let's see, Di San, the third level of patience. Ming Li Shun. He. Um, he, the third level of patience. Okay, right here. This is what we're looking at. Where he is bright, keen, and mm, it's like not hard. Clarity and keenness to accord means nothing to anybody. Sorry. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to sneeze. Excuse me. <coughs> Right into the microphone. Whew. Okay. He reaches the third level of patience where he, um, let's see, which, uh, the third level of patience, um, he, which is, let's see, or where he, or which. Okay, Jin Chuan Shir, what is the subject here of Ming, Li, and Shun? I'm I'm actually yeah. look, looking at the Sanskrit right now, and yeah. Ming Li actually is just translating one Sanskrit word. So oh really? Yeah, it means it's the tr Sanskrit word means sharp or keen. Yep. Tikshna. And I think the th and the, three, the tip. and the three which is tritiya is actually modifying that 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 word. So yep. it's three keen something three keen. And the Venerable Master's commentary, he actually says those three keen things are the the things that you get when you're 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 cultivating and you wake up, the clarity of the heaven, the eye, the clarity oh. of past lives, and the clarity of the extinction of outflows. So, okay. So it's and that's and there's a I don't so it's not actually the third level stage of patience. It's actually three keennesses. I okay. Guess. See how misleading that could be. He, he reaches a stage of, these are attainments, okay, and here they go. He reaches a stage uh, marked, almost like marked by three attainments. I think is the way to say it. He reaches a stage marked by three attainments. Um, so Ming Li as a pair, Tikshna, that word means a tip, like a tip of a knife or a spear, an awl, kind of something very sharp. Um, keen, sharp uh, insight or vision or clarity. And is is it is Ren is the stage or what does he say about Ren? Uh, Jin Chuan Shu, the patience part. Third patient. 
Is it is it the They're patients where we're um sorry so I'm with the fellow so, he's looking at it for me. So a tikshna is the sharp and keen, right? And then correct. this is tritya kshanti, the third patients. So this okay. is not modifying this. Okay. Um the all right. There is Here's here's the way to explain that. There is a um, a meditative state that interacts with the dhyanas that um, has four stages to it, and the sixth stage bodhisattva gets there. That's the idea. So it's the third level of patience. Let's see, a, sta a stage of patience, there we go, patience, marked by three attainments, um, clarity, and what about now shun, how does the shun work? It's, let me, let me use regular English, what is going on here is the bodhisattva's focus becomes sharper than ever, He's, he has light, and furthermore, the shun part is he's mellow. <laughs> that's that's the way to say it. He's not ying, right? He's not hard. He's not insistent. He doesn't have a temper anymore. He doesn't have edges. His edges have been smoothed off. The shun is describing this kind of mellow, laid-back um, quality. Another way to say it would be... Um, He's been beaten on so much as he waits for the pain in his knees to go away. <laughs> this sounds too scary. People are going to start leaving. I see people are leaving the hall right now. Oh, man. What do you mean meditation is painful and burning? Right. Something happens when you sit there patiently, which is you feel like your legs are going to fall off, right? After a while, there's pressure, there's heat, and the number one tool at that point is patience. You just wait. You just wait. You promise your knees that there's a shower at the end of the day, you know, and you're going to sleep like tonight, like always, and you just get through it, and when the fire goes out, you feel uh, clear and cool and clean, right? And it's true. The fire burns you through. That's the shun. Hard to put that into a word, but it's like, you know, mellow almost. You want to say that. Mellowness for the shun. Shun means to flow. You harmonize. You accord with. You flow along, you know. So, I don't know. We need a good word for that. What do you think? What are you going to suggest there, Jin Chuanshir? I really don't know. I'm I'm looking at the he, trying to. We're trying oh, to, you can't say that. You're supposed. You're wearing a robe. You can't say. I don't. I really don't know. <laughs> Come on. You've okay. always been using a cord with. Uh, Take it. Yeah, where he accords it. Yeah, okay. He reaches a stage of patience marked by three attainments: keen, uh, keen. Sh Keen intellect, I don't know. Is it that? It's not intellect. Keen, let's see, sharp, sharp, uh, let's see, insight, keen insight. There we go. We know what insight is. Keen insight, uh, clear, let's see, bright, uh, bright light, Ming, and what? Harmony, harmoniousness. Um, what is it? Content. Content isn't it either. That would be a different word. So bright light and uh, and ability to go with the flow. Groovy, <laughs> laid back, <laughs> and <laughs> California life. <laughs> right? Kind of a... Kind of a Malibu groove. That's what he's got. 
No, that doesn't work. What is it? Um, Easy going. Easy going. It was like you can't get him angry anymore or her, right? So that's the Shun ring. That's not going to pass the censors. I'm sorry. The editors won't let that one through. Okay. Alice, what are we talking about here? How do you translate Ming Li Shun Ren? She's saying, oh no, he called on me again. Why does he do this to me? Why did you mention my name? I was just sitting here. What did I ever do to you? What do you think, Alice? How do you translate Shun? in a way that makes sense. And anybody who wants to, feels pity for Alice and wants to whisper the answer, you can do that. The first word come to my mind is tamed. Tamed, right, tame. Oh, that's really good. Anybody want to improve that? Tame, not wild anymore. Yeah, shun. What do you all think? People are looking at their feet. I hope he doesn't call my name. <laughs> OK. So let's look at the Chinese again. Here we go. He de, here's our verb. What does he do? De ren. He attains a level of patience, which is characterized by, now, Jin Chuan Shi, you said it is not the third. I think it is. The number three, Ming Li Shun Ren. Uh huh. The right? Third. You think so? No. Yeah, it could. Except yeah. Nope. It's, it's, a, it's a title. This is a name of a Ren. It's a, like a, a kind of patience. Okay, here's the way. So if we were to fill in the blanks here, Wow, Jin Hosher actually left. He hope we're not going to call on him. Okay, so it's like, um, all right, here's what we got. Here's how we translate it. He attains the third uh, level of patience marked by Ming Li Shun, right? by blah, 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 and blah. That's what it is. It's three things. And we have to, so three attainments, three qualities. Keen insight, bright light, and tame faculties, maybe. OK? Let's do that for the time being. And we're going to give ourselves some homework this week to go research this. Because why? This is technical. This is a technical term. This is just like saying, um, you know, when you got that degree, when you, when you passed your, your, ex your medical exam, you were qualified to, when you got your nurse's degree, you could take temperatures, provide medicines, and, you know, and change bandages, whatever the qualities were. Um, this is technical. This is not a, a theoretical notion. This means at this level, these things happen. Okay? So we'll come back, come back on this one. And one more sentence. Here we go. Yi yu zhu fa ru shi xiang shui shun wu wei gu. Okay. Because e shama shama gu, that's our structure. Why does this happen? Why did he attain those things? Because, because. So what follows in between is our sentence. Because yu preposition. When it comes to dharmas. Ru shi xiang shui shun, he is wu wei, wu wei, wu wei. Right? This is a fourth tone? Wu wei, or third tone? Wu wei. Third tone. Because he does not 
oppose he sui shun wu wei he follows with and does not oppose zhu fa ru shi xiang the key is this okay we're going to look put it right here i know people want this bigger so you can see it when it comes to all dharmas what does that mean it means how you deal with the world when you're in the world and this includes driving in the car going to the grocery store checking your email all those things that we do okay ru shi xiang this is the key we're we're pulling this apart here deconstructing it zhu fa this is means reality the stuff that we do every day when it comes to the things we do every day ru shi xiang as their actual appearance the way things are profoundly when you go past the surface of them what does this bodhisattva do he sui shun wu wei make this bigger this is what it's talking about our bodhisattva now guess what he's a real meditator furthermore he's in phase 6 his plane has left the ground left the runway right this bodhisattva sees things beyond the surface now he sees past their dualness their bind their you know uh the straight line broken qualities that come with our poor minds that can only hold certain number of facts before they go tilt he's lost that restriction so ju fa ru shi xiang now appear to him the way they really are which is what made from conditions empty wu xiang wu yuan kong wu xiang wu yuan empty no appearance no changing them they're just the way they are he can see that and not go crazy he can still deal with reality but he sees the truth of he can deal with the daily stuff and doesn't go nuts so what does that mean suppose suppose let's let's think of something real suppose you're a doctor suppose you're an md and you're a surgeon and you have cut people open and you understand that just below this level of skin there is creepy smelly sticky icky wet stuff that is like your heart right this pump is going all the time uh we're making what 24000 breaths in one day something like that and the doctor knows that he sees it and he sees the blood and he sees the the stinky stuff inside you know the body is is a machine he knows that and he can still look at people without having to know how they look inside he can still keep his eye on the surface but he knows what's really going on inside and they don't he keeps those two realities separate and he functions okay i've often wondered how doctors do that you know um do do contractors look at a building and see the rebar do they see the 2 by 4s and the 4 by 6s you know do they see the wires or do they see the what we do which is the paint scheme the the picture is crooked no the the plumber sees the pipes going through you know so how do you stop seeing that stuff this bodhisattva now knows that all dharmas everything in the world isn't real it's only there temporarily as conditions come together there's no center to it there's no ultimate final reality to to anything from the body on he's he's it's disappearing all the time it's dying in front of his eyes he doesn't freak out he can stay shun follow along there's our same word that we're working with the the mellow word he can follow along and not get weird he doesn't oppose that 
So he accords with the real mark of true thusness of all dharmas and does not oppose it. Ooh. Let's translate that. Okay. He uh, does not turn away from his understanding of the actual nature of uh, conditioned dharma, conditioned things in the world. Something like that. The ultimate, the ultimate reality of the nature of conditioned things in the world. Right? If he doesn't oppose it, of course not. He doesn't turn away from it. He doesn't retreat from it. He can see it and not freak out. He knows things don't exist, he still doesn't freak out. That's that's real English, right? There we go. That's not exactly Avatamsaka language, but <laughs> you get the point. Okay? So that's hard to do. That takes a special patience. And it takes real stillness. Ah, we have thunder going on. Thunderstorm. He to see that things fall apart and not freak out. Okay? That's what it really says. We're not going to translate it that way, but you get the point. So here's that's our this bodhisattva, when he stays on the ground of manifestation, his practice of prajnaparamita increases. He reaches a stage of patience marked by three qualities. Keen insight, ming. Let's see. Bright light. It's first. Ming. Keen insight and tamed faculties. Thank you, Alice, for that suggestion. Okay. He, he doesn't turn away from his understanding of the ultimate reality of the nature of conditioned things in the world. He sees them as they really are, and he stays with it. Doesn't quit. Okay. Yes. Master I have a question. Yes, um, Jerry. So when we say when someone says he is enlightened, uh, which parameter does he attain? Ah, uh, uh, anyone. Uh, anyone will take you across. The paramitas are not attainments, they're tools. They, when Shifu explains them, he would always say, zi li li ta, zi jiao jiao ta, zi liao liao ta, right? So paramitas are the bodhisattva's power tools. It's what he uses to take others across. So when he gets enlightened, I mean, you can give to the other shore. That's why it's called a perfection. If you practice the perfection of generosity, you can completely give yourself away. If you practice the perfection of morality, you can merge with the precepts until the self is gone. The perfection of patience means you can bear anything. Perfection of vigor means you never quit and you get to the other shore. Perfection of dhyana samadhi means your meditation takes you into profound insight and prajna paramita is how you um, it what wisdom does wisdom becomes expedient skill so you know how to take people across um, expediently fang bian zhi hui right skillful means because you see the reality of it and you're you're still not turned by it okay so any one will take you across, but then you use these to take others across. It's really the paramita is always this bouncing back and forth. Si li li ta, benefiting self, benefiting others. Make sense, Jerry? Yes, thank you. The perfection of banjo playing, in your case, right? Plays the banjo till his son just gives up being bad. Dad, I'll do anything. Just stop. Please stop playing. Anything you want. I'll be good. No, no. Jerry plays banjo very well. He went to banjo camp with some. And his son actually thinks it's a great idea. He loves his dad playing banjo. 
Okay, any more questions? What else is going on? Jin Chuan, Jin Ho Shi, do you want to uh, tell us what's happening this week? Do we have any announcements? What's going on? Uh, we have uh, Buddhism for the Modern Mind Monday night, um, our regular classes throughout the week. And I believe you're coming back next week. Indeed, I am. That I will be there announcement in person. to shake of the snake's tail. <laughs> How about that? I don't think there's anything else specifically. Anything else? I don't think there's anything else specifically. Okay, our classes are underway. They're, um, people know what, what we offer every weeknight and day, along with our Tai Chi in the morning and our meditation on Wednesday and the Insight Meditation Group on Thursday and uh, Marty's lecture on Friday. And uh, Saturday, Sunday, we have Buddha recitation and other events. Um, yes? We have um, something quite wonderful has happened within our community, which is President Obama appointed three people, uh, three Indian Americans, to his um, National Commission on faith-based initiatives. Anybody hear about this? One of those three people is Nipun Mehta. Mm -hmm. Nipun, our very own service-based volunteer, has now been named by President Obama to a national office. How about that? Just boom. We heard that there was something in the works, but Nipun said, don't, don't talk about it until it's real, but it was announced today. So um, that's, that's pretty amazing. Not as if he didn't have enough to do already. All right. Um, for those of you who missed uh, Fractal, this was our participant in our meditation this morning. This is a photograph from about four hours ago. Fractal is a carpet python, six feet long, female, 12 years old. And uh, that's my robe she's investigating there. Some people just don't like snakes. I don't understand people that don't. Actually, uh, Fractal, this is a, she's, um, uh, very, talk about mellow, this is shun, snakes know how to shun, they just accord. And she, she doesn't bite, she does squeeze, wow, strong, strong muscles here. That's a very Australian phenomena to have carpet pythons in your meditation group. <laughs> and this was two weeks ago. These are bearded dragons, no joke. These two were struggling for supremacy. One winner, only one winner can be the alpha male. And we definitely had the feeling that this kind of struggle has been going on since the dinosaurs forever. This is just the, this year's version of it. Not because fighting for female? I, females come along. They're a perk, I think. If you if you win, you you become the daddy. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we will transfer the merit. Those of you who have the um, dedication on your songbook, there your song sheet, you can find it. Otherwise, let's see here. I'll bring it up. Hold on one second, sir. Let me bring this up here. My spot. There we go. Oh, Pasha. Yes. Uh, Bach from Hanoi asked on YouTube when you'd be back in Berkeley. I will be back in Berkeley, uh, but don't go looking for me, all right? Because <laughs> I need some downtime. I will be back in Berkeley on October 1st. Very soon. 
Um, it's it's all work. <laughs> it's it. Berkeley has its perks, and Gold Coast has its perks. Yeah, it's kind of nice to. Uh, I mean, California is in a drought and uh, needs water, and and Australia needs Dharma. So here we go. Oh, 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 stop, stop, stop. Huh. What did I do? Ah, false alarm. I promised myself I was going to do something, and I haven't done it yet. Let me hand this back to Sam. Um, bishop Swing. People know Bishop William Swing, the Episcopal Bishop of California. Um, he, because our beloved Pope Francis, uh, just at the United Nations, mentioned... Um, nuclear weapons. So this made it back. We're going to blow this up big. This was mentioned on Facebook, believe it or not, as, um, let's see, I'll pop that out, as something that Bishop Swing um, wrote as a prayer years ago, several years ago, uh, last year, as a matter of fact, and I was very touched by it and thinking about our transference of merit today. So here's what the Pope said at the UN and um, the context of this is what? Uh, there are people who are very, very aware of the existence of nuclear weapons. They haven't forgotten nuclear weapons. Um, with all the disasters that occur day by day, we tend to take nuclear disarmament, ban the bomb, and kind of put it on the back burner. But there are some folks who say this is actually our biggest challenge still. So Bishop Swing, the founder of United Religions Initiative, URI, is one of those people. And uh, he's been working tirelessly at the UN and around the world to remind people that we're still we have still stockpiled nuclear weapons and they're one button push away from destroying the world. So Pope Francis at the UN yesterday said, an ethics and a law based on the threat of mutual destruction and possibly the destruction of all uh, mankind and I'm gonna, how about that? I'm going to edit Pope Francis's comment. All mankind and all sentient beings, not just humans are self-contradictory and an affront to the entire framework of the UN, which would end up as nations united by fear and distrust. There is urgent need to work for a world free of nuclear weapons in full application of the non-proliferation treaty in letter and spirit with the goal of a complete prohibition of the weapons. Pope Francis says, get rid of nuclear weapons. Good for him. Bishop Swing, last December, wrote a prayer uh, for Voices for a World Free of Nuclear Weapons, read at the United Nations and the Vienna Conferences. So, here it is, and I thought to share this. As we transfer our merit today, let's think about this. A prayer for those whose hearts carry the weight of nuclear weapons. The beginning and the end are in your hands, O creator of the universes. And in our hands you have placed the fate of this planet. We who are tested by having both creative and destructive power in our free will turn to you in sober fear and intoxicating hope. We ask for your guidance and to share in your imagination in our deliberations about the use of nuclear force. Help us to lift the fog of atomic darkness that hovers so pervasively over our earth, your earth, so that all eyes may see a life magnified by your pure light. Bless all of us who wait today for your presence and who dedicate ourselves to achieve your intended peace and rightful equilibrium on earth. In the name of all that is holy and all that is hoped, amen. Hallelujah. Bodhisvaha. Sopoha. The Right Reverend William Swing, President and Founder of URI. So, there it is. 
Um, that's nice. You know, that's our friend, uh, Reverend Usher Swing. Um, we are since since post World War II, um, we've been aware that nuclear a nuclear holocaust is you know that far away. So, what keeps us safe, bodhisattvas? Who knows? Certainly, our prayers have a lot to do with it. So, transfer merit as you would like a better world. Do you want to lead us in a bowing to the Buddhas and we'll see you in person next week? Okay, Amitofo. Bye bye, everybody. <laughs>